Okay. Uh, so hopefully you enjoyed the Android lecture by Lois last time. Uh, I'm going to pick up where I left off um, the lecture before that, and we were talking about different ways in which uh, computation gets implemented. Uh, so if you recall, kind of different degrees of specialization, uh, all the way from using general purpose processors to kind of customized chips. And uh, uh, the real sort of uh, factors that come in there are your performance requirements, but also the cost structure. And if you recall, uh, one of the things was that if you use uh, sort of chips which are made for a broad array of uh, applications, then you share um, uh, the non recurring costs, so all the tooling cost and design cost and stuff like that. And then particularly for embedded systems, instead of using uh, standard microprocessors which basically have just a CPU part of uh, a computer, uh, what are more commonly used are these things called MCUs, micro, uh, micro computer units or microcomputers, oh, sorry, microcontroller units. And in a sense, they, uh, uh, they, they have all the stuff that a typical microprocessor does. But it also additionally has um, uh, memory uh, as well as various uh, peripheral I.O. things like that on it. So you can think of it as kind of uh, almost all of the computer on a chip other than the actual peripherals that you are working with. Nowadays, uh, so as part of the I.O., they may, uh, they would have sort of uh, pins and all to interact with uh, sensors, actuators and all, A to D converters, D to A converters, uh, they'll also include um, radios, uh, various kind of radios, so you can buy chips which have Wi-Fi on along with the processor. Again, these are things on our standard computer that are kind of separated out on the, on the board. Um, so uh, uh, and then I was, then I had talked about that how um, if you look at you know, there are unlike unlike uh, standard processors where Intel and AMD uh, kind of dominate um, when it comes to microcontrollers there is kind of a whole array of companies that make these things a lot of them basically uh, use the processors designed by ARM and uh, but there are a few other families as well so when you go to the websites of these companies again I'm kind of just uh, repeating some of the slides from the very end last time, you would see that they offer kind of a very rich menu of uh, uh, MCUs that you can buy. Um, different memories, but also targeted at different requirements, performance versus low power connectivity, whether they have support for some specialized processing like um, let's say sometimes they may have a crypto unit or they may have radios versus no radios, things like that. So uh, ST Microelectronics is just one of several companies uh, which are um, out there which make uh, which make these MCUs. So I think uh, perhaps the key key thing really sort of as a designer that one ends up facing is that all these pro uh, all these chips, if you purely look in terms of what instruction set they have are bas basically the same, they're using the same processor, uh, but it's the memory and all which end up uh, differing uh, quite a bit. And when you are comparing them, there's a whole bunch of different dimensions along which you can uh, look at them and uh, there's a wide range of performance that you will find out there. So there are microcontrollers which are really kind of single uh, single digit kilohertz type speeds to microcontrollers which go all the way to one or two gigahertz. Uh, and likewise, big range and power. Um, I mentioned last time around how uh, because the memory is on chips, so unlike your standard processors where memory is sitting on the board um, and there is no hierarchy of memory. So the RAM which is used is all SRAM. It's like as if your entire memory was limited to the cache. Uh, uh, so it's limited in size and would at best be, uh, data memory would be at best low megabytes, but usually not even that. You're probably going to be looking at tens of kilobytes kind of memories uh, or maybe 100 kilobytes. Program memory can go to a few megabytes. Um, uh, which is pretty tiny. So, can anyone tell me what's the size of the Linux kernel? 
right? This is so kernel is a part of the operating system which has to sit in the memory, right? Unlike rest of your process uh, uh, which can be moved in and out of disk, the kernel has to, all, at, at, the, at the very beginning when your computer boots up, it basically loads that kernel, right? The kernel takes care of all the IO management, scheduling and all. So, uh, if you have ever, how many of you have Linux machines? Okay, a few. So, you're, when you, if you have ever downloaded or updated your Linux kernel, how big are those files? Take a guess. 100 megabit is tiny. It, the, in the good old days of early 90s, it used to be. So, nowadays, Linux kernel would be a small number of hundreds of megabytes. And that's fine because my laptop has 16 gigabytes, right? I mean, or even if you buy a low-end laptop nowadays, it will have 4 gigabytes or 8 gigabytes. So, uh, like half a gigabyte is really nothing, okay? And uh, that uh, thing is always resident and it's just shared with all the applications. So, if whenever you're running, your computer runs a process, the kernel uh, uh, basically occupies uh, a part of the address space which is common for all the processes. So, whether you're running, let's say, Word or Mail or whatnot, the kernel appears in a portion of the memory which is the same for all the processes. And it's actually a shared uh, thing in the sense that if one process misses, let's say, has the privilege to mess with the kernel memory, then all the other processes are also going to see it. So, the kernel, most of it is really kind of shared. But here, we are talking about RAMs which are uh, lucky to be megabytes, usually kilobytes. So, it's a very different um, kind of uh, runtime and all that you are going to need out here. Um, I mean, if you are uh, embedded systems that run Linux are usually not running on MCUs. They are running on regular microprocessors. If they are running on MCUs, then it would be some very stripped down version of Linux. Okay, really, uh, you, you can you can strip things down in Linux and all and kind of bring it back to tens of kilobytes, which is what it used to be in 90s, but it won't be your Debian or uh, these kind of releases. Uh, so program memory, data memory, all those kind of things uh, are highly impacted. Uh, lots of IOs, that's probably one characteristic of processors out there and the idea being that um, if the IO was off chip, then it will occupy a lot of board space and wiring on the, uh, I mean, the moment you move from inside the chip to outside the chip, uh, the wires are a lot bigger, they need to be spaced a lot far apart, so things are a lot bigger in size. Also, they burn a lot more power because they have more capacitance, uh, so everything kind of uh, goes out of the window. So, for a variety of reasons, speed, integration, whatnot, uh, IOs are very highly integrated. So, you would see MCUs um, uh, manufacturers specialize their chips for different market segments. So, like for example, uh, you'll see MCU specialized for let's say auto industry because um, in the auto industry, there are standards by which uh, standard interfaces and stuff like that, standard buses and all. Likewise for avionics and consumer electronics and whatnot. Um, so, anyway, uh, these are some of the things very important also in this thing is the software environment. No point in buying a fancy processor and then having a pretty a crummy uh, development tool chain and also um, uh, this is one of those industries where uh, you kind of when you when you buy into it then uh, a big part of your investment just is the supporting tool chains and stuff like that um, there are companies who sort of specialize in embedded software and of things um, so towards the very end i'd begin to talk about that how in a typical mcu then what happens is usually you run some sort of very thin operating system uh, kind of commercial term uses rtos real time operating system even though of or, or embedded operating systems um, and we'll sort of go into it in coming lectures on what kind of things go on out here and then usually libraries for managing different kind of things so when embedded systems started out uh, they as i said in sort of the first uh, lecture they basically um, used to be for simple devices and all but nowadays they are connected and whatnot so 
you would see that there is a lot of consideration for having a complete TCP IP stack, not just TCP IP, but ability to uh, talk to web servers or be a web server themselves. How many, uh, oftentimes you must have bought devices uh, or appliances and they themselves act as a web server that is using your phone, you kind of talk to them and uh, they have an embedded web server. So there's a quite, quite a, quite rich sort of networking stack. Security obviously becomes hugely important uh, because they need to be able to do uh, secure socket connections, the kind of things which uh, in our normal web browsing and all we also worry about, so encrypted network connections and whatnot. Um, also, other things which uh, normally, again, in the past, embedded systems didn't used to have to worry about, but nowadays, a big, big one is managing these things. So imagine you're a company, well, let's say, I don't know, an oil refinery. Okay, you have deployed in, in your in your premises. There are probably going to be thousands of these devices. How do you manage them? Um, uh, kind of managing a few hundred devices of laptop types and all is painful as it is. And now imagine when you have ten or hundred times more devices and you have to manage them. And so the whole system administration part of it becomes um, uh, pain, really. Uh, so remote management, uh, patching the firmware remotely and all, all these things also need to be automated. So there are companies and software services and all which sort of uh, do that. So uh, ARM, for example, runs a service called Pelion, P-E-L-I-O-N, I don't know what it stands for, but uh, it basically is uh, management services for catering catering to like large number of IO devices. Um, you also other kind of things. When a device goes down, you need to be able to detect them. So a lot of machine learning analytics kind of things are done on the network traffic that you are seeing. Uh, if a device has been compromised, you need to detect it because otherwise that can become a vector of attacking the rest of your network. So there's a lot of other stuff which has been into it. And then finally, there's your application. And as I mentioned last time around, a lot of these platforms are becoming multi-tenant, uh, namely you get applications from third party sources and sort of download them onto your embedded device to run them. So that's becoming very common as well. Um, so uh, I talked about this particular platform, but I'm gonna skip that. Uh, now suffice it to say that in a typical device, just like this little variable watch, uh, you would find multiple processors out there. Okay, so sometimes, so there is a, oftentimes you will hear the term app processor. And the app processor basically refers to the processor which is made visible to the application developers. But additionally, there are a whole bunch of embedded processor cores uh, which get put there. So if you look at, for example, let's say the Snapdragon chip, which is which drives a typical Android phone nowadays. So uh, when they say it's an eight core device or a four core device, they're really referring to the uh, application processor. But there are probably a few dozen other ARM cores sort of uh, scattered all over the chip handling things like I.O. with sensors, some machine learning tasks, some signal processing stuff and all. So um, what they're doing is that when they were designing the chip, whenever they need a functionality, they kind of ask the same question that I posed last time around, which one of those different computing choices you are going to pick. So just because they are designing a chip doesn't mean that they're going to design every transistor on the chip kind of essentially in a, uh, from scratch or for a custom purpose. Instead, uh, oftentimes for certain functionality, it's they would say, okay, so as a designer, um, that you know, I can do it in software, let me put a small processor core out there. It's hidden, uh, it's firmware may be upgradable, but as an app developer, you will never see it. It would be something that the handset vendor or um, uh, would, would kind of take take care of it. So one place where, like in this particular one, uh, yeah, so there's a main processor, this Kinetis K64F, F, this is the app processor. Um, yeah, and then kind of obviously surrounded by a whole bunch of sensors and stuff like that. But then the Bluetooth part itself, um, so where you see BLE, SOC, so BLE is Bluetooth low energy, SOC system on chip. So this thing uh, has the Bluetooth radio, but the Bluetooth radio requires, uh, the Bluetooth sender requires a kind of fairly rich uh, pro um, protocol suite, uh, which again, in one of the future lecture I'll talk about, but it's complicated enough 
that you really need to do it in software. You can't just create a simple state machine, let's say of the type, like uh, many of you are doing perhaps the VLSI design course, you'll probably be doing data paths and finite state machines and all, but things are far more complicated out here. So the easiest, nicest solution turns out to be just put a processor out there. So this chip has a dedicated processor, which is also an ARM processor, uh, but just a lower, um, variety, uh, lower performance variety, which is dedicated just to running the Bluetooth stack. And then it talks through some sort of a API handshake over, over essentially a serial line that kind of exists out here. So uh, you'll see these sort of uh, simple processors buried kind of all over, not even realizing because they are basically just like uh, in your digital logic courses, you would have seen primitives like NAND gates and multiplexers and all. A processor is nothing but another digital primitive, just a more sophisticated one. So that is, it's, it's in that spirit that these things get used quite a bit. Okay. Um, very important when you're programming these things that um, uh, to go dive into the details of your processor. So when we are programming on uh, yeah, our general purpose computing platforms, uh, we are basically shielded from the hardware quite a bit through like nowadays most of the programming is Python or something like that. So first thing you think of is, okay, I'm just going to download some library and deal at the terms of those APIs. The thought of uh, sort of low level hardware details, uh, forget that, we don't even, we don't even worry about what instruction set architecture is, none of those details, right? I mean, you're sitting kind of way up out here, uh, but with embedded systems, unfortunately, you just have to dive into the details. The reason is that if your chip is coming with all those goodies, like all those peripherals and stuff like that, usually, most of the time, drivers for those don't exist. Operating systems don't even know how to handle it. So you have to learn about the peripherals and their nitty gritty details and what registers do what and all and kind of work, work at that level. So uh, your friend is uh, the uh, manual of the chip, so to say, which describes, uh, it's, it's, it's not so much that you're worried about the details of the instruction set architecture, on processors to the first order are the same. It is what are the peripherals, what are their characteristics, how could you use uh, use them. A, a typical OS running on an embedded processor perhaps not even provides uh, device drivers and abstractions to access most of the capabilities of that chip. Uh, so it's almost like uh, it's the equivalent of as if device drivers are part of your uh, application code uh, or a, a lot of them. So a typical RTOS or embedded OS will provide the common cases. It will provide serial I.O. and those kind of, and maybe access to some timer and all, but much of that capability of your chip is just locked into hardware. And as a software writer, you basically have to seek it out. Otherwise, you will have grossly inefficient uh, performance. So reading that fine manual is extremely important. Okay. so. Uh, moving on, so uh, one thing that I want to spend some time on is energy and power consideration. So while embedded systems come in a lot of variety, implicitly sort of in this course we are focusing on the more resource constrained variety and the resource particular, one of the resource constrained uh, or perhaps the most interesting dominant one in recent years is the whole issue of energy and power. So. I hope everyone knows that energy and power are not the same thing. Energy is the integral of power. So when uh, we talk about it, just take that into account. Okay. So uh, one thing you will find in computer systems is that uh, they often, or processors and other parts of a compute system, they provide uh, modes which make a trade-off between functionality and power. That is your processor or radio or sensor may basically, instead of simply saying it's on or off, the, there might be many modes where uh, it may have some crippled functionality, like maybe my display may change its resolution. So a lower resolution, lower power mode, or maybe a black and white mode, or the radio may have a lower speed mode or a lower range mode. So very, very commonly we encounter this, lower power, reduced functionality modes. So for example, um, if you look at a typical processor, 
often times it will have modes like idle where essentially the instruction execution is stopped but the processor state is maintained so that next time an instruction comes in let's say an interrupt happens instruction comes in it just starts as if nothing happened okay uh, instantaneous state is there stop the clock so one mode that a lot of processors provide is uh, stopping the clock and the reason is that uh, clocks consume a lot of power. In a typical system, clocks may, uh, depending on, clocks may consume as much as half the power of your system. Uh, because essentially it's a line running all through your system, switching a lot of capacitance, so it's burning a lot of power. So stopping the clock is often a very useful thing to do. Uh, and then of course there's power off, but there's a whole bunch of other things like for example in the CPU you can change uh, power by changing the clock frequency. You can change power consumption by lowering the voltage also. So change the clock frequency, lower the voltage. Uh, maybe you can, um, if it's a multi-core processor chip, then maybe you can shut down some of the cores. So instead of all the four cores being up, maybe you keep only one up. So all these kind of things can happen. and uh, again, uh, some of these things are handled by the operating system without you even realizing it, but a lot of it you may need to handle explicitly, particularly in embedded systems. One key, uh, and, and the same story applies to memory. We can shut off parts of the memory, peripherals. Um, I can change quality with which a sensor makes a measurement. Um, uh, oftentimes, one of the key things is that uh, how deep is that sleep mode that we are getting into? And in particular, what state is preserved or not. By state, we mean the things that are stored in some sort of volatile memory as part of your system, R values of registers, things in the cache, stuff like that. And oftentimes, when you shut things off, then some of that state may be lost. So what can you do to avoid losing state? What do we do in computing? Store it, well, like some non-volatile area, right? So you're write it into, like, for, into flash memory or disk or something like that, and then you are going to uh, bring it back. And all of that is going to cost time and energy in itself. So, um, so the state uh, power management uh, or managing whether you actually go into that deep sleep state or power saving state, uh, power setting mode. Sorry, power saving mode in part depends upon uh, how costly it is to save and restore the state. And because if you're if, if this thing takes a lot of time, then you better be sure that uh, the system is not going to need to come out of that mode uh, very soon. So the main power saving strategy is by changing mode. Uh, and basically, you want to align the capability of your system with the workload that you are currently seeing. Uh, excess workload is basically wasting energy. On the other hand, uh, sorry, uh, having having a mode which is more powerful than what the current workload needs would mean wasted energy. It's kind of like I just need to go to the grocery store, but I have a 12-cylinder Ferrari to kind of do that. Just kind of burning a lot of energy. Uh, and the flip side, if the system is underpowered, uh, then you have a problem also. So this whole space, which kind of does this, is a field called dynamic power management. It uh, kind of started when portable devices first began to come, so kind of late 90s, but a lot of research happened in early, early 2000s. Um, and now things are pretty sophisticated, but the basic, at a very high level, you can think of it as that uh, your applications uh, and the environment is presenting you with tasks, a workload. And you have this resource, the processor and the radio and whatnot, which is effectively giving you kind of a knob th uh, through which you can change the functionality versus uh, so functionality, speed, and uh, power. So you can kind of traverse between these things. You can lower the power and lower the power, uh, sorry, you can lower the uh, yeah, you can seek to lower the power consumption by reducing the functionality and reducing the speed. So essentially, that's the trade-off you do. And some part of your system 
either the OS or the application or the hardware has to continually sort of control those knobs so that uh, the hardware capabilities are just, just rightly matched to what the software is doing, uh, what, what, what the application needs. So uh, this is the first order bit. And in this case, uh, it's very good. But then you can go finer. You can say that, you know, even while I'm on, I can perhaps change uh, other parameters. So for example, instead of simply turning on off, maybe I can scale the frequency, change the frequency. So again, starting in 90s, processors began to expose their clock frequency to be changed by, uh, by the software. It sounds very trivial, you'd say, hey, clock is nothing but some sort of a square waveform and why don't I just change the thing? But the problem is that a lot of other things have to be orchestrated. Firstly, deep down in your system, the clock is coming out of a crystal oscillator, uh, whose frequency you can't change that easily. It is what it is. So when we change the clock frequency, it's stuff beyond, above that. So there's kind of a whole clocking circuit which comes into play. But when you are changing uh, the clock frequency, you have to make sure that nothing funny happens at the clock edges, okay? You don't want extra edges coming too close apart because that will result in a fault. Uh, so all, all, all those kind of things have to be managed. So it requires kind of a clocking subsystem which is designed explicitly for exposing these things to the software. But not just that. Um, I can't run a hardware system at an arbitrary uh, frequency, right? Uh, again, if you go back to your digital logic classes, the clock, the, the frequency at which we can clock a digital system is dependent on what? Mm, you're dancing around it. Critical path. Anyone? Like the delay through your combinational logic, right? I mean, uh, that dictates how, what is the minimum clock period. So you obviously can't go too fast, uh, right? Um, so that's one ch uh, challenge. You So the thing is the following, that how do we know how fast we can go? Well, even that is not as easy because if you take n identical copies of the same digital hardware, like literally kind of the same chip, then the maximum clock frequency it can go to will be different because each copy of a chip is slightly different, in manu manufacturing variations. Moreover, as things like environmental temperature change, that frequency also changes. So now the thing becomes, what, what is the maximum frequency at which I can drive that particular piece of hardware at under that particular environmental condition? Um, so it's that, that, that's, that's often uh, non-trivial non, non, non also. Um, roughly speaking, power is proportional to frequency. Faster you run a circuit, the more power is going to consume. So this goes to the heart of it. Don't, you shouldn't be running excessively fast. Now, what do you think uh, if I, so as, as I run faster, what's happening is that all the capacitances in the circuit, the hardware basically is moving more rapidly. So it's like I'm trying to move a mass with uh, more, um, at a, with a higher, uh, speed, so this requires more work. Uh, as I lower the frequency, uh, as we'll see, it's not as if the power goes down to zero, because even when you make the frequency zero, you still have to keep the system powered up. It still has to remember all that state which is sitting in the memory. So uh, while uh, power, uh, when we say proportional to frequency, it's also with a big offset at zero. So it's kind of, the, uh, it would be like, a times frequency plus B, that kind of thing with a pretty large B. But in any case, uh, this whole space is called dynamic frequency scaling, where I'm changing the frequency to match the workload. Now, unfortunately, if power is proportional to frequency, then, and what is, and speed is proportional to frequency, naturally, or another way of saying is that the time taken to do a task is proportional to inverse of frequency, so what do you think is a dependence between energy and frequency? Uh, sorry, energy and, yeah, energy and frequency. So let's say I have a task to do. So energy is what? Power times 
whatever, integral of power, right? So uh, I have two terms, power and the time taken. So if power is changing proportionally to the first order and uh, time is changing proportionally, uh, inversely proportionally, so the product remains the same. So this strategy doesn't do anything about energy, really. Okay, first order. Again, there are lots of second order effects out there. Uh, so in terms of saving energy, it doesn't do anything, but it does lower the power profile. So it's going to help you thermally, but it's not going to help you in terms of first order, in terms of uh, battery life. Okay, so what does help there? So that is where the third thing comes into play, which is when we are changing the clock frequency, so now again, if you go back to the basics of the way hardware works, the speed of your transistors and your gates and all depends upon uh, the voltage with which we are driving them. If I'm taking the same gate, uh, same, same, same logic gate and run it at 5 volt versus 3 volt versus 1 volt, the speed is vastly different. So what this suggests is that if I'm lowering the clock frequency, then I can also simultaneously lower the voltage. Because, uh, um, so if you go back to your gate network, your digital logic, uh, digital logic uh, hardware, then remember I said the clock period is determined by the delay through the combination logic. But if I am lowering the frequency, that means I am increasing the allowed uh, period between two clock edges. So if my voltage remained the same, then I'm going to be basically getting end, ending up with a lot of dead time. So what if I simultaneously lowered the voltage, make my gates run slower, and so that they can always occupy the entire clock time that I have available. So this third strategy basically says I'm going to control both these things simultaneously, voltage and frequency. I'm, whenever I need a lower speed, I'm going to lower the clock frequency and simultaneously I'm going to dial down the voltage. Now the problem is this mapping between voltage and frequency as to what frequency can I, uh, to run at a particular frequency, what's the minimum voltage I need? That again depends upon a specific piece of hardware at a sp specific temperature and other conditions. So uh, we are introducing all these complexities, but uh, there is a lot to be gained out here. To the first order, power is proportional to frequency and voltage square. So as you can see, frequency is proportional to voltage. That means power is proportional to voltage and voltage square, voltage cube. So power and voltage have a very nice relationship. Power is roughly voltage cube. Again, very first order model. What now we can begin to uh, gain on the energy side, okay? By lowering the voltage and frequency simultaneously, we can actually gain on the energy side uh, as well. Let me kind of just work uh, this thing out. So, so modern systems to fully avail uh, really do this and do this. This is kind of more of a thermal thermal way, okay? Because it's not buying us anything on the energy side to the first order. Uh, I keep saying the first order because it turns out when you have a battery, then let's say I want to, let's say I run it, I, I draw one milliamp for one second. And in case number two, I withdraw half a milliamp for two seconds. So you would say, okay, it's the same, right? One milliamp, one second product, then half a milliamp, two seconds, same product. The problem is that the batteries, the chemistry of the battery and all likes working at a lower current. So when you operate a battery at a lower current, that is withdraw energy at a lower rate, then uh, it can last longer, okay? You kind of see these effects when your battery dies and then you leave it for a while and it comes back up. So there are all sort of these chemical effects and all where because of which this can still help, but these are second order effects. This is kind of really our main thing. Uh, and, and what this is saying is uh, that half the speed of your, uh, not just the speed, but the actual capability of your hardware be well matched to what you truly need, okay? So that you benefit from the fact that um, uh, that uh, I can run at a lower voltage. In effect, it's kind of like saying, um, if I have 
an hour to come from my home to UCLA, there is no point in having an excessively powered car because a car with a higher power engine just basically intrinsically is less efficient. Okay, so you should size the engine of the car or voltage of the processor just right so that it has just the adequate speed to reach the deadline just in time, no sooner. So, so these are your three strategies, right? Shutting things down, scaling the speed only, but leaving, uh, so it's kind of like uh, 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 just uh, rest of the hardware is still what it is. And here you are actually messing with uh, the voltage part of the hardware. You're literally kind of making it a slower hardware. Sorry, this yeah. uh, thing with uh, uh, smaller currents and longer times of operations, uh, does it uh, only applies, uh, it does it only apply only to uh, lithium batteries or it is uh, just okay, like so a general rule? Great question. So firstly, this one, uh, I guess re referring to the, when I'm drawing less current out of the battery than the battery yeah. being more efficient, it's true for all the chemistry. So the oh, battery, okay. Yeah. What is not, uh, lithium batteries are better in one regard, which is, remember that effect I said, uh, it's kind of a memory effect uh, where if you, um, well, two, two effects where lithium batteries do better than other chemistries. One is that, uh, uh, you often hear about that if you repeatedly charge the battery to uh, before it has fully died down, then you are reducing the capacity. So nickel cadmium suffers from it, but not lithium. And the other one is this thing I mentioned a bit earlier where the battery apparently dies and then recovers, okay, so as if it has regained the energy. That is present in lithium, but far less so than other chemistries. Okay. Uh, rest of this stuff is really a characteristic of your um, technology, right? The hardware technology really is independent of the battery. Okay, so uh, there's a course which dives deeper into it, but uh, I just wanted to get uh, these things out. Now, I talked about the modes and stuff like that. So usually in the processors, you will find a dedicated power management controller and which will, through some instructions, expose all these capabilities to it. Now, some of these capabilities I talked about are really part of the processor. Uh, this one, possibly this one. This one really requires some additional cooperation from uh, rest of the hardware because you're changing the voltage as well. And voltage is really part of the power supply. So somehow the power supply has to cooperate. Although there are some processors, some microcontrollers where the, uh, what are called as power regulators which basically clean up the voltage supply, they are actually on chip. And you would see that these processors often have what are called as multiple voltage domains. So you'll, uh, so like they may say uh, 12 voltage domain and so many clock domains. What they're referring to is that this big chip has many different regions and you can independently control voltage and frequency of different regions. Okay, so there are, there are chips like that. But more commonly, the voltage would be something done by something at the board level and just exposed to you as a peripheral. Your power supply basically is as if another peripheral from which you can, which you can read and control somehow. Um, so, so if you look at this processor, which is the same one in that little uh, smartwatch type device that I showed earlier, so you'll see it as a power management controller, which has some registers with some bits and stuff like that. You can set, reset and all, and thereby you can control the modes. There is an instruction called wait WFI instruction, which is which stands for wait for interrupt. So the typical, a very common approach, and this is usually going to be done at the OS level, um, uh, which is if there is nothing to do, it will, the OS will say, okay, now let me go into some sort of an idle mode, this wait mode. And there it will execute this instruction WFI, and that will wait for an interrupt to come. So the idea would be, if some interrupt happens, like some sensor says, hey, um, the system is about to hit some object, or maybe a network packet arrives, or some other I.O. happens, then uh, we come out of the WFI, and kind of you restart. So very, uh, so at least when it comes to dynamic power management, a uh, very common, uh, th th this would be useful, right? You go into a low power mode, you execute the WFI instruction, and then you kind of come out of it. Again, 
usually, hopefully, you have a good enough OS that handles this thing for you. Okay, uh, but if not, then uh, or or if you're using no OS, no OS, then you are going to do it. Uh, there is also modes related to frequency uh, so that is you can lower the frequency a lot to go into the very low power mode and there's a lot of other stuff i mean i just grab the table which talks about low power mode and you'll see kind of the immense amount of richness which is there now the problem that happens is that these generic rtoses that are written and often handed out for free they just don't have the resources to tailor things to each and every chip which is out there. And like I said, there are hundreds of these chips from different manufacturers. So even though notionally they are all on processors, let's say most of them, uh, but in reality they have lots of differences. So a lot of um, capabilities when it comes to power management and all are kind of unused unless you sort of read up about it and kind of bring it out. So. Yeah, so what this thing is showing you is um, uh, how uh, uh, supply current versus core frequency. So um, the current we are drawing from whatever the power supply is and how it changes with the uh, core frequency and uh, yeah, I think a couple of different modes depending upon what's happened to the peripheral. And likewise, generally speaking, as you would expect, well, increase the clock frequency, things go up, but as you can see out here, it's not growing up in exactly linearly, right? I mean, I said earlier on, okay, the other thing is it plateaus out. At very lower frequency, it plateaus out, right? Uh, it's no longer proportional. Why do you think this is happening? Why, why is there this plateauing out effect at the lower frequencies? Mm, maybe, I, d I don't know, but just to, uh, so we we have to like as you said earlier to support uh, this volatile memory which drains current. Mm, yeah, that's true. So that's one instance of a general issue, which is there's a lot of hardware which has nothing to do with the clock frequency. It's just has to be there to keep keep it powered up. Even your power supply, right? Even uh, uh, power supply trickles out some current your memory which has to just maintain. So a lot of the hardware is not uh, changing its power consumption proportional to the frequency at all. It's just kind of like an overhead, right? I mean, uh, uh, which, 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 is, which is not scaling with frequency. So at lower frequencies, what's happening is that the power consumption of the part which is changing with frequency is no longer dominant. You are dominated by this architectural overhead which is sitting there which you just need to keep powered up for the system to be available and so you basically get dominated by dominated by that so this is that constant b turn that i was referring to uh, but even otherwise the uh, current is i mean it is convex that's nice um, as we'll uh, it turns out but it's certainly not kind of a straight line there are kind of more uh, more subtleties out here okay so uh, uh, oh one other thing i wanted to say is that when we if, yeah okay i don't need to go back for that but um, when we say we can change voltage and frequency and all one issue which also comes up is that even though the hardware may allow you to change voltage and frequency but it's usually just a small number of discrete steps it's not as if i have an analog dial and i can just dial in an arbitrary frequency you just have some discrete steps, maybe choice of four to 10 frequencies and voltage available. So you kind of have to uh, uh, find the right match. So let's say uh, I want to run a program for a certain time and I don't have an exact match for a frequency available for it, right? Because I only have discrete choices of frequencies. So what would you do? To take a frequency next, uh, uh, like uh, you have a frequency and the, you take the next step available after uh, it. Okay, but then I am wasting some power. Yeah. Could you do better? Could you fake the exact frequency somehow? Mm, no, 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 it's much easier. You run the processor part of the time at that faster and part of the time at that lower. Mm -hmm. 
with just the right ratio, right? So, yeah, so that, right? So, part of the program I'm going to run at that next higher frequency, and part of the time I'll run the program at that lower frequency. I sandwich the two and just decide the right proportion. So, you can fake, okay? Just uh, nothing deep about it, there's nothing to do with hardware, right? I mean, it's basically if I have to get a value f, then I just find a times f1 plus b times f2, which kind of get it some of two frequencies, okay? Um, so, uh, this, the, uh, the, uh, uh, the energy and power issue uh, are oftentimes a lot more subtle and something that you have to sort of keep in mind also. So, uh, this is an example of two very old processors, but uh, just wanted to make the point out here. So, one of them is a 32-bit processor, <coughs> consumes a watt, runs at a gigahertz. Uh, it's an old embedded processor from Intel. Uh, another one is, uh, this is what is used in um, Arduinos or early Arduinos, okay? It's um, 8 bit, 50 milliwatt, 10 megahertz. And the question is, which one is better? They're obviously very vastly different beasts. This one consumes 1 watt, this one just consumes 50 milliwatt. So let's say if I were to ask you, I'm designing a system which needs to be energy efficient, what would you use? You say strong arm, you said, yeah, someone there said the right one, right one. Okay, which one? Why? Why did you say strong arm? Well, if you see the power relation with respect to frequency, mm -hmm. this is having a better performance than that. Exactly. Right? So remember, I said energy efficient, not power efficient. Power, clearly, that guy is lower. But the point that he's making is that if you l look in terms of uh, um, uh, that what what kind of almost like the ratio how much energy per clock cycle this one comes out ahead right and assuming I'm doing equal work in each clock tick this is better but actually the story doesn't even end there this one is a 32 bit processor that one is only an 8 bit processor so at the very least this guy is doing like four times the work every clock tick so that's another factor that you gain so uh, you see that uh, when you actually benchmark uh, the energy uh, consumption. So what you see out here is on a few different tasks, FFT, cyclic redundancy check, and a finite and post loss response uh, uh, filter. And what you have is on the left-hand side, it is that 8-bit processor, the low power processor, where I'm trying to execute this, except that I need floating point and also it doesn't even have a floating point unit. So I'm faking floating point by in software. Um, the Y curve is a, a log word. So the difference between the two is orders of magnitude, okay? The 32-bit you know, one is a lot, lot more efficient, okay? Now, of course, what's happening is I'm throwing a pretty heavy duty workload at it. So that 32-bit processor, which has a more sophisticated architecture, wins out. On the other hand, if I had shown some trivial kind of thing, sleep and wait for an interrupt, right? Or do some very simple stuff, then the 8-bit processor would be a lot more efficient. So it's a little bit like what we face elsewhere in computer architecture that we have sort of small amount of very fast memory, which we call as the cache, and we have large amount of much cheaper memory, the DRAM, which uh, which is slower. And we kind of try to create the illusion that I have large amount of low cost uh, and very fast memory by creating a hierarchy. So same thing out here that uh, uh, perhaps we can combine multiple processors in the same system to give us best of both the worlds. But you can do it only if we can shut things down because if this guy is going to sit idle and burn a watt, then it's not going to help us. But um, uh, main takeaway out here is that don't be fooled by confusing uh, power with energy, okay? Things which may be higher power may actually be better in terms of the energy consumption. Nothing, nothing very deep about it, but it's very easy to miss, uh, miss that point. So, when we say a system is low power, what do we mean, right? I mean, usually 
people are really worried about battery life and these kind of things, right? I mean, uh, the thermal considerations are usually the secondary ones. Um, uh, but there is another thing to the story also, right? I mean, um, we also have to make sure that the real-time performance is maintained, right? I mean, for example, maybe I can run something with really little amount of energy, but if it's going to take an hour to do, then it's pointless also. Um, so, what the game we are playing is there is some allowable or acceptable latency. There is, and then within that, and, and there is some allowable thermal envelope, right? You don't want the thing to burn you. And within that, you want to maximize the battery life, right? I mean, that's, that's so it's really an optimization problem, but you need to think of all the constraints that are there and not just blindly be lulled into kind of terms which we use loosely, low power uh, versus low energy versus power efficient versus energy efficient. These are all terms which we often take synonymously, but they, 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 they're kind of, kind of different. So what this is showing is um, the 32 bit platform and uh, so to suspend it. So now one of the problems which often also comes is that if you have a complex system like a complicated processor, then it has lots of hardware in it. Among those hardware, it will also have registers, right? Lots of memory bits and whenever you are suspending the processor, you have to remember all those bits. Uh, either you have to remember or if you keep them powered up, then your sleep is not going to be very efficient because it's all like you're still preserving stuff. So the impact of that is that putting to sleep and waking up a bigger processor or a more complicated hardware is always going to be a more expensive proposition. In this case, um, uh, what, uh, what, what, what you see is that the 32-bit processors, they take a, uh, to suspend versus resume, the resumption is taking a lot of time. Now, this is an old slide, so this number is much, much better nowadays. Uh, but the point is that it's consuming, uh, taking a lot of energy and consuming a lot of power just in this act of going from that fully active mode to the sleepy mode and coming out of it. Whereas, the low power platform is a lot better. Its sleep mode, for example, is only for microwatts. And nowadays, you can buy uh, low end microprocessors, which are perhaps even nanowatt, or I've seen some stuff in literature of picowatts kind of stuff. Now, this resumption, 10.6 millisecond, this is an old number. This is from Linux. And the reason is uh, so, I guess I'm a lot older than you, so perhaps. Uh, you guys have not noticed, but uh, if you go back to laptops of 10 years ago, you will open the lid and then you will wait while the system restarts. Okay, and nowadays we're just used to I press on my phone and it's instantly on, right? So what uh, so what was happening was that before mobile devices really pushed for optimizing this resumption number, and a lot of patents and stuff like that which have really sort of driven that. It used to be that essentially the operating system will go through a whole kind of akin to a full reboot, okay, and uh, take take a lot of time doing that. Ten, uh, so if you if you notice how much time a typical OS takes from rebooting from no power, like from a total shutdown mode, many tens of seconds, okay, often minutes. Uh, on the other hand. Um, yeah, from a hibernate mode, it's kind of pretty quick and on devices like phones and all much quicker. So a lot of effort has gone into optimizing this stuff, but um, but uh, it used to be a lot worse. So, so what all of this kind of boils down to then is that if I'm trying to design a system with energy and power considerations in mind, then ideally what we would like to have is a system which is what a term which is used is called energy proportional and what this is basically saying is that the amount of energy that the system should consume should basically be proportional to the work it is doing if i ask it to do 
no work it should take zero energy if i ask it to do increasingly large amount of work in any given time interval then it should just accordingly take more energy so if you look at uh, this is just an example from uh, a smartphone so if you look at the kind of workload systems like these face there's a high degree of variation right i mean uh, here the user is swiping there's a clock face every time um, you know, the clock hence move or something, there is a spike of energy and uh, other times the things are dormant. You kind of see the same thing, for example, let's say uh, a digital assistant like um, Echo or Siri or Google Assistant, one of these kind of things, Sim similar story. They're actively listening constantly, right? So there's a baseline workload which is happening. Then whenever the keyword is said, like whatever, Alexa, okay, so it suddenly kind of does some processing and all, and then it goes into a, a more refined, uh, more, more, more capable mode, right? So there's a large degree of uh, sort of variation which is happening. And what you would want is, if particularly for battery power thing, that your, um, work, your, your profile of the power being inst instantaneous uh, power consumption should basically bite that curve, okay? I would like when very little is being done for the power consumption to be very low and then take a spike and so on and so forth. That's, that's what we would like to have. And the problem is that the challenge that we face is that to be able to do these peaks efficiently when a lot of work is happening, like when it's trying to recognize my speech and stuff like that, then at that point in time, I need the more efficient processors. Because if I don't have them, then as I showed, those tasks take, uh, uh, I'll basically be extremely inefficient in those modes. But if I only had the big processor, the more processor which is more capable for high workloads, then when I'm doing very little, then it's almost like I'm basically leaving a high power sports car on idle and just burning power. So what you would like, is a system which is behaving like a like that low end microcontroller during the low workload mode and like that more capable sports car when it is in the high high workload mode okay so um we are at the 7 p.m point wanted to ask how many of you want to have a break just one person okay let's do a two minute break bio break or whatever okay just You know, I gave out 36 or 37 PPEs, but not everyone. I think there are four or five people who have not enrolled, so I guess it's probably 30, 32 or so. Okay, because um, like last week I'm on a. Like, so you want a PTE? Yeah. Just write to me. Uh, right. Send me an email. Okay. okay. Are you on the waiting list? Yeah, did you receive my email? Like, uh, oh, you were the one who had a marriage in China? Yeah. Or something? Okay, yeah. yeah. Right. Okay. Um, Send me an email again. Right. Thank you. <coughs> I have um, a question. Uh, I wanted to know if, if there's a possibility for us to see like a previous projects from this uh, previous projects because I wanted uh, to know how how ambitious and complex that is. Yeah, so okay. are any of you still looking for PT numbers? Anyone looking for PTE numbers? You are? Yeah. Okay. So write to me so that I give you a PTE number. Yeah. 
First class. Yeah, first time. What do you come in? Oh, they learn programming and uh, some programming and some analysis and some I wasn't in CCLE, but they're not ready yet. So I, okay, if your goal is that you want to see the assignment before you decide to take the course, my suggestion is not take. <laughs> okay. uh, I mean, the idea behind the course is not that the instructor gives you all the assignments and then you decide whether you want to take the Oh, you go to your web, wherever you register for it, uh, and then you can register by giving us a CD. Yeah, I'm just going to write it. 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 I'm just going to
And then as our workload changes, we activate one or the other. Okay, And you find this thing extremely uh, common. The key thing is that the software can run on either one of them and other than a different level of performance and power, uh, it won't notice a thing. Now, we can take this thing even further and we can uh, often also have processors which are even more specialized, perhaps are not even able to run the same operating system and maybe even have a different ISA. So in this case, this processor, maybe let's say it's a single processor or uh, some other specialized processor which is able to do or, or maybe even a simple microcontroller. Uh, it, uh, so my program cannot be run as is out here, but maybe I can have a similar functionality out here, right? Um, in the sense that I can have a re-implementation of whatever, if I need to do, let's say, a machine learning algorithm, I can have a model running in each one of the processors, except that for these two cores, the big little cores, it may be exactly the same code. Whereas for this guy, it's a re-implementation designed for this one, okay? So this is called heterogeneous core, right? The, it has a different ISA, okay? Uh, and so, so these two are much more tightly coupled, whereas this one is kind of a separate little thing uh, which, is, which is out there. And now uh, what I can do is if I have a appropriately smart software, then I can basically activate the right processor at the right time. And uh, so uh, during times of whatever uh, high demand, I activate the big and otherwise I'm in the small processor or uh, little processor. So uh, the magic out here has to somehow come from uh, kind of the software and moreover uh, to avoid sluggishness of performance, maybe we can even seek to be, be smart about it and be predictive a little bit. But in anticipation of a higher spike in workload, I can activate the big one and so that when it act, but when the spike actually occurs, I'm kind of ready for it. So there is a lot of smartness you can imagine uh, which goes in this thing because on one hand you want to maintain a happy user, uh, sort of not miss deadlines, the system should appear agile. So it's as if I had the big processor always on, but yet not waste energy. So uh, kind of that type of illusion that you want to do. And the age old debate in this thing has always been who does, who carries this heavy lifting? Is it the hardware? Is it the operating system? Is it the application or application with the compiler which compiles the application? And the issue is who knows, uh, the thing is who knows the state the best? So let me ask you the following. So let's say you had the, you faced with this problem, right? That you have to design a system where when the workload was going up, uh, it will uh, activate the big processor and otherwise the small processor where will you realize this functionality? So again, three obvious choices, hardware, operating system, and, and applic applications. So what are the trade-offs there? So let's talk about, let's say hardware. What are the pros and cons of doing this juggling in hardware? It's going to be the fastest in detecting. It's going to be the fastest in detecting what? Like power changes. Power changes, but can it predict it? No, it it will not. react to it. It's, real. it's going to react to it. Okay, you are doing that. Um, so kind of like what you said, but like uh, in hardware, it, it can't interpret reasons. Like for when people use more mm -hmm. advanced features versus not. Yeah. Great you point. Look at the data. Yeah. So hardware has very limited insight. Okay. I mean, one thing processors do have is access to is that they know what are the next few instructions coming because there's a pipe, there's a buffer of instructions. So they can do a little bit of look ahead, but they, they really don't have any context. In fact, they don't even know which application this these instructions belong to because the fact that you have processes and all is Hardware is not even aware of it, right? I mean, that's all an operating system kind of thing. So hardware lacks a global view. And as we put it, hardware lacks the kind of being able to reason about it, right? Uh, now, hardware can still do some stuff. Like it may notice that, oh, I'm seeing a spike on a regular basis, for example. So there's some stuff it can do. Um, if the workload is insanely predictive and all, maybe it can kind of learn some stuff about it. So uh, with appropriate 
hardware, you could sort of bring some of those things out. But generally speaking, fair statement, uh, fair, fair conclusion that hardware will be kind of reactive because uh, it's basically going to operate on the instantaneous state and it lacks kind of a global view. Okay, let's move up. OS. So, what are the pros and cons there? So now the oh, so hardware is just going to tell do whatever the OS tells. Okay. So it's slightly more powerful in the sense that the OS can view all the I/O and all the applications connected to the that the CPU is computing in a reason on that level. Mm -hmm. but, yeah. Yeah. So OS OS by design orchestrates multiple applications. So it has kind of more of a global view of what is happening, right? It knows about what are all the different applications. It can deconflict them. It can take care of things like it knows that you know there are so many applications which are uh, which ask for this stuff and all. Okay, so so the OS has a bigger picture. Um, uh, unfortunately, one thing it still doesn't have is it doesn't have the application logic, right? I mean that is obviously in the application. So if the app, so if there is something, some funky behavior and all which is in the application logic, then unless the application conveys it to the operating system, OS has no way of knowing. So let, let's say, for example, even trivial stuff like um, a clock application wants to tell the uh, a clock application knows that on a periodic basis it needs some animation, right? Every whatever minute the Mickey Mouse comes out of the clock face and does some an animation. Okay, so how do uh, the question then becomes how does the application convey this all this information to the OS? Unfortunately, uh, uh, you basically have a information bottleneck of sorts between the way applications talk to the OS. So a lot of work has gone on where OS try to interpret what the application is trying to do. They try to model different applications. Say, Aha, this one is periodic and therefore its behavior is like this. This one really is unpredictable and so and so forth. So try so smart power aware OS can try to do all this stuff to develop some sort of model of the behavior. And that brings me to the third one, application. Now application obviously knows about its behavior, right? If the programmer is willing to assist the power management of the system, then it can expose this information to the OS. The only problem is that OS has to provide the APIs to be able to express these things, and usually they don't. So, uh, so, so basically, kind of none of these three points, none of these three things are entirely satisfactory for different reasons. Um, that is, the place where we can where we can do it most easily, uh, most efficiently, is the hardware. The place where we have a global view is the OS. And the place where we have the application logic is the application. So the three desired things are kind of scattered over the stack, and uh, somehow you need to kind of work work around this. So different systems make kind of different choices and stuff like that. But um, there's no clearly like you can't say this is the, the right choice. Now having said that. Generally, for a variety of reasons, OS is kind of like the master of the system. So more typically than not, you will find that power management resides in the OS, except for the part of the power management which is very safety critical. Like for example, if the processor would be at the risk of burning out or whatnot, that stuff will sit in the hardware. Uh, so that kind of thermal, thermal management and all what rest of the stuff. This usually at the OS level, and you will find in more sophisticated OS, they will provide um, programming interfaces so that the application can convey information about it. Even trivial ones like, um, you know, don't shut the system down because while it may appear I'm not doing anything, actually the user is giving a presentation and this, there is a slide on the screen. Okay. Uh, so, uh, so you see uh, these things uh, like on your Android phones until fairly until two or three generations of uh, ago of Android, um, uh, there was a concept called power lock, where the idea was that you think of your system as kind of different resources, and an application could lock uh, uh, power lock a particular resource, essentially telling the OS, don't shut it down. I'm going to be doing something in the background. Now, as you might imagine, immediate problem that happened is there were buggy apps. So they will power lock a resource and then forget to release it. So then the system is burning power away. 
uh, iOS took kind of a totally different approach. iOS said application developers are incompetent or whatever and you want to keep the user happy. So it does the power management behind the scenes without this thing. Now, having said that, the two have converged. I think the recent releases of OS are, sorry, recent releases of Android are a lot more like iOS in this regard. That is, they have taken away that power from uh, from the uh, from the application. In fact, to the extent that some the latest releases of Android have even begun to clamp down on the type of background processing that is possible. So I think power management clearly is really a first order consideration in mobile OSs. So you see a lot of shifting uh, there as well as on the hardware side. Uh, there is a lot of low level hardware power management takes place. L like I mentioned that hardware can attempt to predict what is happening and all. So there are um, kind of little machine learning stuff sitting down deep in the hardware which tries to anticipate or learn the characteristics of the workload, learn the characteristics of that particular user and optimize the power management to that. So, um, so that's what goes, goes on. Um, this big dot little started a few years ago and nowadays you kind of see it in every major uh, mobile processor for sure and a lot of embedded processors as well. So this is the Samsung Exynos and what you see out here is it has four A15 cores which are the more powerful one, this is a big one and four A7 cores these are kind of the little one. They are instruction set wise identical that is you can literally have the same OS, same program in fact they are treated as exactly the same other than the fact that this is less, it is lower down in that power performance curve. Uh, so uh, in what ways do they differ? So if you look at A7, it is, um, so that's the uh, simpler one, the uh, little candidate. It's an in-order processor versus A15 is an out-of-order processor. Anyone knows what these terms mean? Yeah. Out of order is. Yeah, yeah. No, you're right. So, right. Out of order is like juggling around. Like yeah. My resource is kind of busy. I cannot do the next and then come back. Right. So, uh, A7 in order, what it means is that in my program, if I look at the assembly code of my program, the instructions are in some order. And it is going to execute them exactly in that order. Okay, so if it turns out that I could have executed the next instruction, let's say my one instruction is uh, integer add, and the next instruction is uh, a bad example. Let's say one instruction is uh, fetch fetch data from memory location and put it into register R1, and next instruction says move value from R3 to R2. There is no dependence between them, right? Uh, one instruction says get data from that far away memory, get it into R1. It may take some time to do it because memory has a lower, uh, higher latency if, uh, uh, thing. And the next one I could have done it if I had swapped the order, I could have gone ahead and do it and program won't notice anything. Um, but uh, in order would insist that one instruction finishes before the next, next one occurs. Whereas out of order, deep down in the hardware, it continually analyzes and it says, can I go ahead and do the next instruction? And it could be for a variety of reasons. I gave the example of memory, but he talked about some other resource. It could be multiplier, kind of some other hardware resource. So it, I, can, I can reorder things and applications won't notice. It turns out though that some of the stuff in past a uh, year and a half or so, which is emerged as it turns out these reordering and all introduce some security risks, uh, um, information leakage risk, but it's been a big boon in terms of performance because you can increase, if you were to just do things in, lock, in, in, in sequence, then uh, you are underutilizing the hardware. Pipeline 8 to 10 stages, pipeline 13 to 24 stages. So pipeline is one of the ways we speed up the hardware and so uh, 15 to 24, but of course it comes at a cost. A lot more pipeline registers and stuff like that. So as you can already see, that while the program won't notice any functionality difference, but 
there's a lot more going on in A15. Here, there is a single queue for all its execution units. So there are a bunch of execution units, but they are sitting in a single queue. Whereas here, each of its eight execution units, so there are 14 more execution units, and each one of them has a multi-stage queue. Again, a lot more sophisticated queuing architecture. Here, two instructions can be processed per clock cycle, and here, three instructions can be executed per clock cycle. So all this stuff, which is more parallelism that resides in A15, comes at a cost, and that cost basically manifests itself that it's higher performance, but then if you are not utilizing that higher performance and you're just to keep all that hardware there, you're burning a lot of energy. So, oh yeah, go ahead, please. So, uh, when you say it has like eight execution units, mm -hmm. uh, what are those again? So, remember, every instruction needs to be executed, right? Let's say it has to do an addition, or move value from one register to another register. So, traditionally, like, um, and when we first learn about computer architecture, we basically say that the processor does that. But here what happens is there are multiple execution units and they can each do all that stuff. Okay, so if I have one, one thing which is adding R1 to R2 and putting it in R3, and the next instruction said add R4 and R5 and move it to R6, and if I had a single execution unit, I have to do one, then the other. Here I have eight, and if they're independent, I can go ahead and do it. And in fact, hardware does a lot more sophisticated stuff, okay? There are ideas like speculative execution. I will go ahead and assume this needs to be done. So great exa uh, example would be the following. Let's say somewhere in your code you say, if condition, do this, otherwise do that. So what modern processors do is, so now if condition, the problem is that until I have evaluated, until I know about the condition, I can't do this, but I have a pipeline system, right? So if, if I have a conditional check, then I will have to stall the pipeline until I done with the condition. What modern processors do is something called speculative execution. They'll basically say, based upon the past, I have seen that whenever I have come out here, uh, I've always, the condition has been always true or mostly true. So I will go ahead and assume it is going to be true this time also, and I'm going to go ahead and execute the true branch. And if I'm wrong, I'm going to unroll the computation. Okay, so all these kind of smart things go on, but that comes at the cost of more hardware. Like to make that prediction, modern processors have simple <coughs> neural networks or some other predictor, it's called branch predictor, some sort of hardware which is doing it. So to squeeze, to increase, the effective number of instructions you can do, actually do, not just the number of execution units you have. Um, uh, you uh, sort of introduce a lot of other complexity into the hardware to make the magic happen. None of this, again, to the first order, applications notice, okay? They only notice better performance or worse performance, but they don't notice any functionality difference. Um, and that's what's going on out here. So. ARM provides a whole bunch of cores at these different points, okay? I mean, uh, there are now A50 series cores, and also there's a, there's a rich variety of cores which kind of exist, and you can pair them up. You can even have, like here there is only pairing. You can have maybe three different points or n different points, and as long as your OS can, OS or hardware can kind of switch between them, you're in good shape. Go ahead. So like when you have a four of them together, <laughs> how do they like assign tasks between each other? So it's like if one of them is like busy doing a bunch of instruction instructions, does it just like pass it to the other one? Or? Great question. So these are independent processors. Now, in this particular process, in this particular chip, the way it was, I'm going to answer your question in a bit, but the way it was done was one big and one little formed a pair. And within each pair, either the big or the little had, could be on. So one of them had to be on, one of them had to be off. Okay, in this one. So let's say top left A15, top left A7. That was a pair, one of them will be on. Bottom left A15, bottom left A7, one of them has to be on, okay? So I could have any combination from all four A15 to all four A7 and some other combination later on. And then what the operating system was doing was within each pair, it had to active, decide which one to activate. And it is really doing it overall. 
Now, in these things, you can't take a, uh, so, so if you think of the code you write, if your uh, code has a single execution thread, then it can only run on a single core. But if your application has multiple threads that it can do multiple things in parallel, then it could be one thread runs on one to four and another runs on a different core. And certainly you can run different processes on different core. So this is, uh, so what I can do with these things really kind of now depends upon how the applications are written. If my entire software was written as a single execution thing, then I can only make use of any one core at any given point in time. So uh, we'll talk in the next lecture about different ways of organizing software, but just think of it this way, that if my I have to write my software in a manner that I am explicitly exposing the parallelism that is there in my system so that the OS can assign them to different things. And the big part of the OS, uh, one, one of the key things that the OS does is to do that <coughs> task assignment to cores. It's, it's responsible. Uh, can't like all the eight cores be used at a... You know, in this particular process, chip, as I recall, not all eight could be on. But general, like oh, in general, yeah. So that's more of a chip designer's choice, okay. right? And big dot little, it is not restricted that only. Oh, in big dot little, whether it's restricted or not. You know, at the time this thing came out, it was, but I'm not sure right now what is the thing. Okay. Yeah, something, maybe you can find out then, okay? Um, I mean, again, there is no strict reason that it has to be this way, I think they were viewing this thing more as a quiet core processor where each core really had a big dot little in it, okay? And it probably had more to do with perhaps thermal issues and all. There are other, other challenges that arise in these things also when you are moving from one processor to another processor, what happens to things like interrupts? Interrupts were coming to one processor core, now they need to be redirected out here. So all this sounds simple like I just have painted four blocks out there, uh, but uh, Sup supporting it, there is a lot of memory architecture, I.O. architecture, all those kind of things which need to be provided also. And sharing of the caches, how these different processors are connected, how does how are the data shared among them, all those kind of questions come up. So there's a lot of um, stuff that computer architects do uh, goes goes behind, behind this. But it's pretty cool uh, in a way. So uh, you can basically now uh, the A7 and A15 are really, as you can see out okay, there, really kind of sitting in very different part of this power performance spectrum. And you basically, it's a, between the hardware and the application and the OS, you kind of traverse, traverse, this, traverse this curve. Uh, so how do we go around doing it? This is where you kind of get into the world of uh, yeah, heuristics, algorithms um, of different types and stuff like that. One strategy is you could track some sort of a weighted average of the CPU load and then based upon that make a decision, right? If the load starts going up, you react to it, activate the big processor. But then you're always reacting. So perhaps you can have something smarter. You begin to go into a predictive mode. You can basically look at some of the system parameters and try to say, you know, the load is going to go up. And maybe you can do that by a couple of ways, some sort of an online system, or maybe you collect a lot of data and then develop a predictive model, neural net or some other machine learning model, and then put bring that in. So almost everything you can imagine, there's probably a paper around this thing. There's like a zillion papers around uh, these, 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 these kind of uh, topics that people have done. Uh, bottom line though is that uh, you can achieve a fair bit of saving in this uh, in this game. So what the y-axis out here is the saving. So the blue curve is what the CPU power saving is, and you see pretty impressive saving. I mean, effectively almost like factor of two savings going on uh, with this big dot little compared to an A15 only. Okay, but remember, CPU is just a part of the system. The actual system savings are going to be a lot less because rest of the system besides the CPU is not benefiting from it. On mobile devices, the we have more of this standard uh, microprocessor plus external memory type of architecture because the memories in our phones are pretty big, right? I mean, how much memory do you think your um, phones have? 
huh? three, three four i think some of the six, some eight. of the one have six and eight now but uh, that's where we stand right i mean so but more typically like apple iphones are supposedly three or four okay yeah uh, they still manage to do much better because it's a more optimized kind of system but we are kind of setting around that number um, uh, so you can't put that onto the same chips a lot of memory so they're, they're sitting as outside okay um, so uh, high-end chips have that big dot little clusters and then they also have heterogeneous multi-core okay so the stuff that i talked about uh kind of different isas so you like when uh, apple says hey i have the u1 chip and an m1 chip and these kind of things these are specialized heterogeneous cores which they are uh, creating for other purposes like accelerating machine learning or handling some sensors or stuff like that and all and nowadays almost everyone kind of has some sort of a neural accelerator for neural networks um, uh, sitting on the same thing so uh, what uh, so this is uh, uh, snapdragon and what you would see is that uh, they use very heavily uh, uh, in case of uh, qualcomm something called hexagon dsps so this is Qualcomm's DSP architecture meant for signal processing. And uh, they have a whole bunch of these. Some of them are not visible to you because they are part of the radio modem. So like, for example, when you see that, oh, it says uh, radio firmware being updated and all, it's basically updating something out here or codecs for sound and stuff like that. But uh, in recent years, Qualcomm also opened up some of the hexagon DSPs which are on the Snapdragon for application programmers also. So you can download the hexagon compiler toolchain and all, and then the DS, the, those hexagon DSPs that choose to expose, you can still uh, kind of use them. So in particular, um, uh, we used to, uh, my, my group used to work with Qualcomm a little bit and all, and we used to use the hexagon DSP which was attached to the speech codec, and it was programmable by us. So basically from my Android app, you can push down some code into uh, the hexagon DSP and kind of do some certain kind of processing out there. But nowadays, it's a lot more standardized, and Google even has a language whose name slips me right now. But basically, you can write a piece of code, and it can kind of transparently use the uh, hexagon DSPs as well. But the bigger point I'm trying to make out here is that the modern chip architecture basically has the big dot little clusters, a whole bunch of heterogeneous multi-core like hexagon DSPs, and then accelerators like the neural accelerators and all that. That's what sort of what, uh, we end up having. Okay, so that was on the compute side. Now I wanted to provide kind of a less deep uh, view to uh, kind of some of the other aspects that exist in these systems. So um, one of the uh, uh, key things that embedded systems engage in is interacting with each other, with the network, and interacting with the physical world via sensors and actuators and all. So, uh, so, so you have IO interfaces. Uh, which is essentially, loosely speaking, are defined as interfacing with nearby peripherals and all, okay? So it's kind of like IO to the nearby world. And then communication interfaces like radios and ethernet and stuff like that, that happen. So again, uh, you would uh, see that the there are a whole bunch of different kind of IOs that exist. So for example, I mean, you have this main processor, which is talking to so many different things, right? Talking to display, there's a whole bunch of sensors out there. There is like uh, accelerometer, magnetometer, there's a gyroscope, there's a barometer, there's humidity sensor, there's a whole bunch of sensors and all. And somehow it needs to kind of talk to these things. Now, in this case, these are separate chips, right? These are not sensors on board this thing. It's usually rare to find sensors other than the more trivial ones sitting on the same chip. And the reason is that oftentimes these sensors are made using uh, kind of different kinds of technologies. So like they may require uh, what are called as MEMS sensors or even other kind of things. And making them in the same process, the same semiconductor process as the main CPU is often kind of tricky. Uh, so these things are usually separate board level devices uh, for the most part. Uh, so anyway, all these things, even talking to the battery charger and all, they are kind of essentially different kinds of 
I/O interfaces, which sort of go all over your system. Um, so, um, uh, typical issues as I, as you might imagine, uh, which arise in I/O. Firstly, uh, you have requirements on data rate, latency, uh, synchronization. So, oftentimes when we exchange data, you have to deal with the fact that the two parties may have different clocks and yet they need to be able to talk to each other. So either, I mean, life would be a lot simpler if there was a single clock that I can just distribute everywhere. But usually that's not the situation and certainly not over wireless. I can't send clocks over wireless. So, uh, so synchronization issues also, uh, uh, usually you're, uh, you will be very limited by uh, how many wires you can have between the two parties. So all the data is being squeezed through a narrow interface. You have to worry about that. Uh, power supply requirements, what if they're operating at different voltages and all. Uh, and then uh, what is the abstraction that we are offering? So how is the device, uh, let's say this, this sensor, what is the soft, what is the view it is offering to the software out there? Like how is it interacting with that? So these are some of the questions that arise. Let's kind of look into it a little bit. Uh, a little bit. So, one thing that you will find is that I/O devices make themselves visible to software in one of two very common ways. One is that they basically become a part of the uh, data program memory. It's as if part of your address space somewhere you will say, "Aha, this is where my radio is." Okay, so it will appear to you just like your standard data memory, except that it so happens that instead of going to a SRAM or DRAM, you're actually going to an IO device. In this case, I can use the very same instructions and the very same type of programming abstractions as I would for any standard memory. If my, if my uh, let's say for example, if my radio offered a register called send and a register called receive, and it was sitting in my program memory space, then all I have to do is to define a data structure where I have a field called send and a field called receive, and I map that data structure to that location of memory. And it basically, from a software perspective, just a specialized uh, a data structure which is in a particular location of memory. Or alternatively, in some processors, we have specific separate handling of I/O registers. And when I say some processors, I really mean Intel processors. So Intel processors have special instructions for reading and writing from I.O. devices. And in this case, my I.O. devices really sit in a separate address space almost. It's like a separate world. And I interact with them through these other type of instructions. And that, that, that introduces benefits of sorts. My I.O. devices are kept separate, but kind of an ugliness creeps in that now I can't really use the same programming abstractions. My compiler has to kind of, uh, uh, I, 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 in, in, in the right hand case, I can define a data structure and then simply say address of this data structure is that location in memory. I can't do this on the left hand side. So the programming becomes a lot more, uh, lot more painful. So there are deeper uh, abstractions, uh, uh, deeper issues out here. So IO device registers, uh, versus this, uh, some things we have to watch out, you can't cache I.O., right? So standard memory data structures and all, to speed things up, I, the, uh, the actual data structure is sitting in the DRAM, but we maintain a copy in the cache, right? So that we can more rapidly read and write. I can't do that with I.O., why can I not? Hmm? Expand on it. You have cached a copy of some data, mm -hmm. but the sensor has sent some other data. Right. So, so it's to, to sort of expand upon what he's saying is, so um, if I have a copy, if my data structure is in the main memory, but I have a copy in the cache, if I'm the only person reading and writing to it, then I'm safe. But if the hardware can also change it, then I have no way of knowing. So if I were to cache the copy of device registers into, into the cache, then, uh, um, then if a new sensor value comes in, who tells the cache that now the value has changed? Uh, so the cache have to be IO aware of some form. 
So one of the ways, or actually, any, does anyone has anyone seen this thing? Like, I mean, if I have a variable whose value could be changed behind the scene by hardware, then how do I write it in C or C++ kind of languages? Huh? Volatile, exactly. So volatile is a keyword that you can put to tell the compiler, don't cache this thing, okay? Uh, someone else can change. Timing matters, okay? So that's very important also. A lot of times you'll see these funky devices and all that will have things like write to this register and then make sure you write to it again within a millisecond or something like that. How do, we, how do you even go around doing that kind of stuff, right? Again, uh, it needs to be handled at the lowest level in the device drivers and all. Reading and writing can cause the hardware to do some function, okay? So one has to be careful about it. You can't just willy-nilly write, read and write because every read and write can have some side effect. There are devices that say, when you read it, then not only are you reading it, but actually the hardware goes out and fetches the next byte. So these are side effects that are happening and one needs to be careful about it. Can't undo the effect on the physical world, right? I mean, if it was just a memory location and I was wrong about writing the value 10 to it, I can go back and rewrite the old value to it. I can't have the robot arm unhit an object. Uh, so uh, can't undo that effect. And then sharing across applications can be really challenging. Um, if I have multiple applications which all want to use that particular hardware device, then I have to make sure that they are doing it in an appropriate order, which kind of makes sense. And this is where the OS comes in. OS basically becomes a mediator of sorts, right? It basically takes requests from different ones and kind of do, do them in the right way. Sometimes the OS may say, you know, this device is for exclusive access only. If one application is using it, no one else can, can touch, touch it. So this brings to, uh, so the first approach, which I mentioned is the specialized IO instruction. It's as if I have two different address spaces. I have my regular address space, which is the standard memory, and then I have a bunch of I.O. ports, which are handled by special I.O. read-write instructions. Uh, so in Intel x86, they have that. And what it does is, it in, uh, the, these instructions, these I.O. instructions, are made available only in the supervisory mode of the, uh, of the hardware, okay? so. Uh, more, uh, these these uh, these processors have multiple modes in which they can operate in, and the operating system operates in a more privileged mode. And these I/O instructions are by default not made available to an application. They only only the OS can do it, and therefore the device drivers in the OS are doing it. Now, again, mind you, this thing is basically more of an x86 thing. More common approach is that everything is in a single address space. There's a single memory address space, except part of it we reserve for mapping hardware devices into it. So now we are accessing the devices exactly like any other memory location, except they are kind of different. We can't cache them and so on and so forth. Um, but benefit we get is that we get to use the very same instructions which we are using elsewhere in our program. And uh, we also benefit from using memory protection mechanisms. Here, all the I/O instructions were basically available only in the privilege mode. Here, I can do finer grain stuff. I can say, you know, this hardware I'm giving, uh, this hardware device I'm giving access to a process because it has a right privilege, so that it can directly read and write to it. I can't do that kind of finer grain assignment of hardware devices. Uh, um, uh, to processes in this particular mode. So uh, these these two are the common approaches, and which one is better? I mean, like with much of engineering, it's really uh, trade-offs. Uh, I mean, you can make the case for either, but I think at this stage, probably fair to say almost everyone uses the second mode, and nothing precludes you from using the second mode even with the Intel processors. Um, yeah, but the first mode is more uh, unique to Intel processors. Or So coming to the uh, sort of the MCU side of things and all, perhaps the most, the workhorse of I.O. are the so-called general purpose I.O. pins. And these are basically digital pins which can be read or written by the software, okay? Sometimes they're input only, sometimes they're output only, and sometimes they could be both input and output. 
sometime uh, or whatever very often they are multiplexed with other specialized functions so you can either use them directly you can say change pin number a9 or they could be part of a serial port or a usb port or something like that they are very versatile because since i can control their state directly from software i can make them do anything except uh, I may not be able to meet the timing requirements in software, right? Because at the software level, I'm kind of limited to the speed of the software. And besides, if the only when the OS lets me run it. So which is where all sort of other specialized functions come into play. But you would often see things like blink LED programs and stuff like that. You could do all of that out here. So uh, GPIOs are kind of uh, your friends in the sense that you can do anything with them, uh, and if the performance is tolerable, then you are good to go. Um, uh, they're also your debugging friend, right? Because it's you're, you're working with these systems where there's no nice screen and all, so usually by twiddling these GPIO pins in this creative manner, you can observe them externally through uh, oscilloscope or uh, some other test instrument. Uh, you can profile whatever the runtime of your program and stuff like that. Uh, so very powerful um, uh, way of working with this. There's a counterpart of that, which is uh, analog pins in uh, these things, uh, so analog IO or AIO as they're called. And they are also, they could be read and written by software, except behind them are digital to analog converters and analog to digital converters. So AI pins are A to D converters. And the things that, as usual with any ADC that you'll worry about is, what's the bit resolution? So how many, when they read the analog signal, how many bits they're mapping them to, and whether they can sample them periodically or asynchronously. So more bits, better they are, obviously, in terms of the errors they are introducing, but um, obviously it comes at a cost. And likewise, sampling, uh, whether you are periodically sampling or asynchronously sampling depends upon your algorithmic needs. AO pins are digital to analog pins, and again, same kind of things, periodic versus asynchronous updates. Uh, often, we need additional circuitry behind them. So for example, uh, you may need amplification because if your input signal is very low voltage, you might want to amplify it and you might need filter. Um, uh, anyone, why do we need filters? with A to D converters. Remember? What kind of filter do we need and why? Hmm? You're literally going. We use low pass filter in front of A to D converters. Why do we do that? Okay, so what frequency will you run your A to D converter at? Hmm? Signals and systems 101. Nyquist sampling, anyone? Okay, right, so two times F max, right, except you are running at this thing at some rate, so you have to make sure F max is less than half the sampling rate. So you are going to put a filter to filter out anything above F max, uh, above uh, half the sampling rate. If you don't do it, what happens? Uh, Aliasing, distortion, right? So, so that's that's one of the reasons. So amplification, just because the signal value is low, is it okay? And uh, oftentimes you will see multiple analog input pins share an A to D converter. So the idea is for a while it will work with one pin and the next pin and it kind of keeps rotating. You can't do that with output pins because you can't multiplex multiple analog signals into the same output pin. But for input you can multiplex. So I'm going to stop out here and we'll see you on Wednesday.